with uh, the DeVivo. Thank you for being on top of that. We need more parents and school board members paying attention. I, I would be very curious to find out, and I would bet you that Mark Twain's books, Tom Story and Huck Finn, are not used in the school system because it uses the N-word. And someone was offended by that. I guarantee, I would bet you that's the fact. I bet you they're reading those books. Those real American classics. Actually, they're being republished. Well, what somebody is, but there's some objection. Anyway. So, uh, what do you think of this guy, Scott Walker, in Wisconsin, huh? Of all the places to end up in, in Wisconsin, I mean, I love Wisconsin, I've been there, their beer and cheese is terrific, and now they're finally, this is the birthplace of liberalism, by the way, Wisconsin. That's where Earth Day was first started, you know, back in uh, Madison, Wisconsin, you know, back in the 1960s, which happened to be Lenin's birthday, that's why it's on that day. But have you seen the conduct of these people? <laughs> the offensiveness, right? The pictures of Hitler and equating Scott Walker to Hitler and, uh, and, and just the, the nastiness and the meanness. What happened to the new civility? What happened to the new <laughs> civility, remember, after that tragic shooting of Gabriel Gifford when all the left-wing liberal bloggers came out and the news came out and said, oh, it's the Tea Party that started this. I think they have a lesson to be learned. You watch what these union guys are doing in Wisconsin, they make the Tea Party look docile. But, you know, if within 18 hours, within, I'm sorry, within 18 minutes of the shooting of that woman while she was still on the ground, before they even met it back to her out to the hospital, they were sending out Twitters and blogs saying that the Tea Party caused it. They couldn't even wait to get her in the hospital. And that very night, Paul um, Krugman, the New York Times liberal writer, wrote his column blaming the Tea Party movement for their uh, you know, elevating the rhetoric. Tell you about Paul Krugman. On election night 2009, the night of Obama's election, this is the guy who holds an effigy burning party of George Bush in his house. And he has the audacity. So it just tells you the double standard. It also shows you that you win. When we get the battleground to Wisconsin and collective bargaining for government units is fighting on the chopping block, we're pushing back in the right direction. But I'll tell you that two years ago, two years ago today, when I look back to what I was thinking, I was like, oh my goodness. Barack Obama had won the White House, the Democrats controlled the Senate, the Democrats pulled everything, everybody, there was nothing in their way. Nothing in the way of that far left faction of the Democrat Party of advancing their ultra liberal agenda. And I thought, this is it for America as I know it. That'll be changed forever. But, you know, Americans didn't let me down. We realized in their guts, in our heart and souls, across this country in a spontaneous explosion, that the very core values and principles on which this nation was built were under attack. And we rose up on April 15th, and what is now history will always write about as the Tea Party movement the day America turned around and started putting itself back on track, and that's thanks to folks like you and have put this movement together. And we are winning. We are winning. Just think about two years ago. They thought they were going to pass card check. Remember card check? Yeah. Card check was going to take away the right of, of workers to have a secret ballot on whether or not to be unionized. Let me tell you something. Card check is dead and buried and it's not coming back. Thanks to you guys. <laughs> and of course, there's the big health care battle. And that's still raging on, and we got set back with that, but hey, we elected a new Congress, and they're defunding it, and my good friend Ken Cuccinelli, the Attorney General of Virginia, is moving that to the state Supreme Court, and I think it is unconstitutional, and I ultimately hope the Supreme Court will make that decision. So we fought that one back. And then there's an attempt to take over the Internet. You know, I think the President and his allies know very well that the Tea Party movement erupted very much through the internet, through Twitter and Facebook and blocking and emails. And so the best thing to do, I guess, is for them to take control of it. So they want to control the internet. But, you know, the big issue that really began everything was something called cap and trade. Cap and trade is really the ultimate attack on our American prosperity and our liberty, uh, an effort to drive down our energy consumption, to drive up the cost of energy so high that we just don't consume electricity, that we just don't drive our cars. You know, the people behind this stuff aren't going to be happy until we're back to, you know, eating bark off of trees and living in the woods. The cap-and-trade movement
began early with the threat of global warming. You notice that global warming this winter, right? Yeah, global warming, they said. Al Gore and his buddies said global warming is uh, man-made global warming and the icebergs are melting and you're, the, the, we're going to be underwater and we have to stop global warming by stopping America's pollution. And, and everybody seemed to be totally on board with this. I mean, I, I, the, the media, public opinion, um, the science, of course, they said, then we began to push back against that. It was enormous effort, and we fought really, really hard uh, back against the cap and trade debt. It was very, very difficult. I mean, when I say everybody was on board, I mean everybody, Republicans and Democrats. Listen to this gentleman, for example, in 2008. The debate's over. The science is agreed upon. The debate is over, and the science has said. The debate is over. It was Arnold. It was over. Arnold said so. Oh, by the way, he was going to run for president. Remember they were. The debate is over. The science is in. Everybody go home. We're going to have cap and trade. We're going to drive up our energy rates. We're going to drive the cost of gasoline over 10 bucks an hour. And we're going to save the planet. And no one was opposing it. And oh, I believe no one was opposing this. Check out this guy. Oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Nancy Pelosi, lifelong Democrat and Speaker of the House. And I'm Newt Gingrich, lifelong Republican, and I used to be Speaker. We don't always see eye to eye, do we, Newt? No, but we do agree our country must take action to address climate change. He's toast. He's toast. He's done. He's never going to escape that. But that was at the peak, right? I mean, that was at the very peak of the global hysteria. And that laid the groundwork for the International Plan on Climate Change, that, that UN scientific initiative, to roll out all their flawed science and their misrepresentations, and ultimately lay the groundwork for the President of the United States to say this. Under my plan uh, of a cap and trade system, the electricity rates would necessarily skyrocket necessarily skyrocket. So what? What does he care? He's not paying for it. This is not necessarily skyrocket. must necessarily skyrocket. Well, it seems to be inevitable. Arnold said so, Newt said so, Gingrich said so, scientists said so, but we began to fight back in great organizations like the Cato Center, the Heritage Institute, um, the uh, Center for, for uh, Capital Formation, many other think tanks like mine, and scientists and universities, free market economists across the country began to, ex to expose the real high cost of cap and trade and what it really meant, what it meant to our economy, what it meant to driving jobs overseas, what it meant as a, the Asian Full Employment Act is what we called it as we watched China opening 52 coal power plants, one a week in one year, in the wake of the big, biggest hydroelectric power plant ever built in the world, the Three Gorges Dam Project. We saw it. And we began to change the course of public opinion. And back in 2007, at Americans for Prosperity, we launched a series of rallies around the country. We called the Hot Air Tour from places like South Dakota and Texas and New Jersey and New York and everywhere, where we began to raise the specter of the threat of cap and trade, what it really meant. And we came under withering assault from the liberal media. I mean, Rachel Maddow and her buddies just couldn't believe that we could actually get up and say that global warming was a scam and that the cap and trade move was an absurd, ridiculous, and costly attack on our economy. They were bewildered, but America changed their opinion. And it was not an easy trick. It took a couple of years to fight this back before it was too late. But, you know, there's a great economist. I'm an economist. I'm an Austrian economist. And this gentleman, Friedrich Hayek, wrote a phenomenal book in 1948 called The Road to Serfdom, which he won a Nobel Peace Prize. And in that book, he writes simply that the liberal left agenda is sold very easily in emotion-based politics and simple sound bites. doesn't take a lot of science to back it up. But the conservative message of free market economics and, and true individual freedom is much more difficult to explain and much more time-suing to explain. But when you get it out there, we win over time. And that's what we did in cap and trade. So with a long, expensive, and difficult battle, we beat cap and trade. And we sent it.
to the yes heap of history? Or did we? <laughs> or did we? Now, folks, unfortunately, we did not. After beating cap and trade on the federal level, after it was passed in Congress, and then we stopped it in the Senate, what we thought once and for all, this gentleman, Mr. George Soros, came back and said very simply, well, if we can't pass it on the national level, we'll knit it together in a state-by-state -state basis. And this can be done with car check. New Jersey has a car check bill. My New York might too. New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, Vermont, um, ten northeastern states have now passed a cap and trade bill exactly the way George Soros said, and exactly in keeping with the vision and the wishes of this gentleman, Mr. Al Gore. How did this happen? <laughs> You know, back in 2007, a gentleman by the name of George Bataki here in New York began this process. Began to form a cap and trade compact between 10 northeastern states, now known as the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Ultimately, this program was built by this woman, Ms. Lisa Jackson. Lisa Jackson was head of the DEP in New Jersey in 2008 under John Corzine. She architected the cap and trade scheme that is now being used in 10 northeastern states that was initiated by Pataki. So it looks like New York and New Jersey is ground zero for cap and trade. And it was rather prescient when at Copenhagen's climate, UN Climate Conference in 2009, the Danish ambassador introduced Lisa Jackson to a room full of a thousand screaming, meaning liberal European diplomats that this is Lisa Jackson formerly head of the DEP under John Corzine in the state of New Jersey, now appointed by Barack Obama as head of the federal EPA, and Ms. Jackson will do for America what she did for New Jersey. Oh boy. New Jersey and New York. Her 10-state cap-and-trade program passed in my state in 2008 and in your state as well, is identical in every way to the cap-and-trade scheme put forth in Congress and then defeated in the Senate. In fact, when you read the bill, there's a sentence in this bill, and this was arrogant at its very peak, and this is how they believed 100% in 2008 that cap and trade was inevitable. There's actually a sentence in this bill, I'll give you the short version, it says that this bill is designed to segue into a federal law when passed. In their mind, science was in, the debate was over, it's a fait complete. America's going to cap energy production, drive out jobs, drive down our economy, our quality of life, and electricity rates must necessarily skyrocket. But think tanks like the Heritage Foundation and others came out quickly with an analysis of the New York and New Jersey program and realized that the cost of electricity to our ratepayers would double under this plan by the year 2020, over nine years away. And I remind you that today, right now, we are operating with a full-blown cap-and-trade program in our 10 states. And then we came back with the Heritage Foundation report. So now what you have is, you have the map of America. We have 10 northeastern states that have cap-and-trade right now, today. Now they want to add California. They want to add California. And then they want to add the Midwestern states because the Midwestern states had launched the cap and trade trading program under what's called the Chicago Carbon Trading Commodities Exchange. And that Chicago Carbon Trading Exchange was set up by Al Gore's investment firm and others. They went out of business in December. And going out of business, Al Gore and his firm walked away with $17.6 million. So we certainly know how Al Gore's commitment was to saving polar bears. But those states now have somewhere to go. Where will they go? They will go to become part of this network of states. And as you can see from the map, they're achieving just what George Soros talked about. Now, I want to stop here for a minute and talk about how this works. Because I just, in doing this all the time, so I assume you understand what cap and trade means. Cap and trade means capping uh, carbon dioxide reduction and trading permits for producing that carbon dioxide production. Under, a cap and, under the cap and trade plan known as the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, every power plant that produces energy using coal 
oil or gas must buy a carbon permit for every one ton of carbon dioxide that they emit into the atmosphere. This is calculated by the energy they consume. They have charts and that say that, okay, one gallon of diesel fuel produces 2.5 tons of carbon emissions. A pound of coal produces three tons of carbon. So based on a power plant consumption of fuel, that power plant is then required to buy a permit for every one ton. Now, once they buy a permit, it applies one time. They're constantly buying permits as they're burning fuel and producing electricity. Those permits are now sold at auctions at the regional greenhouse, which are held on the internet. There have been 10 auctions so far since 2008. People who are certified to trade in those auctions, to buy these permits, you have to become certified, you have to register. These auctions are secret, they're not open to the public. We don't know who's buying what permits. We do know who some of the traders are. Anybody want to guess? Goldman Sachs. Government Sachs? Yes. <laughs> First Pride. Morgan Stanley, Citibank, all the top folks, a bunch of unidentified firms, uh, Saudi Arabian firms. Uh, private firms, and the commodity, or the um, energy producers themselves, who can also buy their own permits. They can't buy them all, though. So why do people buy these permits? Why would there be money involved here? Well, Goldman Sachs goes into an auction, and they buy a million permits, say. And right now, those permits are trading at about $2 a piece. You buy the permits, and you hold them, and you wait till the demand increases as the supply goes down over time, and you then go to an auction and sell them as the energy companies have to bid for these permits. It's projected by economists and research, and it's hoped for by people within this industry, that over time, as this spreads nationally, the value of those permits will increase to between $20 and $100 a piece. Now, do the math on that. If you buy a million permits and you put in, oh, let's just say it's one of us. We buy 500 permits, or 1,000 permits at two bucks a piece, that's $2,000, and then sell them in two years for $20,000. $20,000, right? That's uh, not, not a bad profit if you can make it. Or let's just say you're a Goldman Sachs and you buy a million permits at $2 a piece. You're talking astronomical profits. Those permits go to $100 a piece, that $2 million is <coughs> what? $200 million. Not a bad profit if you can make it. The cost of those permits, when the energy producer has to buy them, is passed directly to the ratepayer in your electricity bill, passed through 100% as they're purchased month by month, year by year. The concept behind this is that by driving electricity rates up, necessarily skyrocket, you will be forced to use less electricity. We will be forced to consume less electricity. Less businesses will be able to utilize electricity. A business coming into New York and New Jersey, looking at this as a place to say manufacture or build a factory or whatever, is going to say, wait a minute, we can't afford the power here. We're going to China. We're going to India. Thus we call the uh, Asian Full Employment Act. And once they relocate, they're not coming back. But this is the only time in history that I can find where a scheme like this has been put in place where speculators can manipulate the market and make enormous, enormous profits. Profits so enormous that they make the subprime mortgage derivative scam seem like nothing. And pass that directly to the ratepayers. The dollars involved are this. As of today, $777 million in carbon permits have been auctioned off. If they go up in value 10 times, that right off the bat is what? 7.77 billion, all passed to ratepayers, all into the pockets of the speculators and those who manipulate the marketplace. That's why this is the most devious and dangerous government policy I have ever seen. And while this was happening under our very noses, we thought we beat it on the national level. This was taking place right here. And Americans for Prosperity sounded the alarm the beginning of last year, and we said, this is still going on. People don't even know it. So we went down to Wall Street last May, <coughs> put 300 people in front of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative building to protest their secret auction. 300 people on the middle of a 
A work day on Wall Street is not an easy thing to do. They don't like me there. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. I think some of you guys might have been there with us. But on that day, there wasn't a single bill in a single state to repeal this cap and trade bill. Both Republicans and Democrats don't want to talk about this. On that day, we recruited our first sponsor in the state of New Jersey, a little lady named Allison McCose, assemblywoman from Sussex County, sponsored the first bill to repeal cap and trade in any of these states in the country. She was alone, despite the fact that she came under attack in New Jersey because our governor, Governor Chris Christie, is reported to be a strong supporter of cap and trade, and she was told not to do it. That was then. She broke to the ice. We now have 37 sponsors on the New Jersey bill, and last week in New Hampshire, Americans for Prosperity, our Tea Party activists, finally repealed cap and trade rate bill in the first of the ten states in New Hampshire by a vote of 256 to 104. <laughs> laying, the groundwork, laying the groundwork to begin the domino effect. See, I believe that once we repeal this now in New Hampshire, New Hampshire is a small state, it's probably as big as Rockland County. And uh, New Jersey is a big state, though, and we're on our way to defeating it in the state of New Jersey. And if that happens, this thing's going to go down like a ton of bricks, like dominoes. However, in the state of New York, we cannot find one single legislature to put their name on a cap and trade on a rich repeal bill. Not one. And you have a much bigger legislature than we have in double, triple the size. Not one Republican or Democrat will put their name on a repeal bill. There's a project for you right here. But we put together a coalition, New Jersey Restaurant Association, the National Restaurant Association manufacturers and dozens of other groups in this effort to repeal the cap and trade. But I think it's important to the future of our, our prosperity. But I'm going to do something a little bit different tonight, folks, than you've seen. I'm actually going to lay out to you how we're going to defeat this, how we're going to defeat the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, what we want to be doing right here in this state and in every state that we are doing as we speak. You may have seen or heard this. The first step in our four-point strategy really involves you guys, and that's engaging the grassroots, and that's why I'm here tonight, to first educate people about the danger of this program before it's too late, and to engage grassroots activists like you to forcing our state legislators to take action. They need to be accountable to the Tea Party, some Republican or Democrat who is going to sitting there saying, oh yeah, I'm with the Tea Party, I'm with you guys, you're great, then put your name on the repeal bill. Put your money where your mouth is. Don't just come up and give us lip service. They need to hear from you. We need to write letters to the editors. We need to get on talk radio shows. I do it all the time. Uh, we need to engage grassroots activists in something very precise. Sponsor the bill like we did to repeal the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative in the birthplace, which is the state of New York and George Pataki, home state. Um, you might want to call George and ask him what he was thinking about, by the way. That's step one. Step two, the um, repeal of cap and trade and all the grassroots activities should be, will be followed, it is being followed up with direct mail. Targeted direct mail, educating voters on the record of their legislators um, and why they're not on a repeal bill is already going out to key dark targeted districts. Direct mail and, and mailing, really people will be like Tea Party type activists. Step three is mass media. Some of you guys may have seen this at all. I'll show it to you in a minute. Our TV and radio buy that really moves popular opinion and really ticks off the left because if you're going to have a fight over something, the other side has to be out there to fight. So, And the last part, part four, is our internet activity, the use of new media. Overlaying all of this with blogging, email, uh, YouTube videos, um, Facebook efforts, the way the Tea Party movement was actually born uh, is a whole new component to the strategy uh, of defeating bad legislation, overturning bad legislation. Then the last component that we brought to bear, and that's investigative reporting. Our New Jersey watchdog has uncovered some phenomenal information. It's an investigative reporting website, and it really should not just be New Jersey watchdog, but it's covered this whole area. For example, he's reported on the fact that the calculations by the admissions by Reggie themselves, the Reggie bureaucrats themselves, that they made a monumental miscalculation in their predictions of how this program would affect carbon emissions, and they expect now to have no effect on carbon emissions in these 10 states until it's best the year 2031.
by which time rates will have quadrupled. Now, cutting carbon emissions in the Northeast would be nice, but what's the rest of the world doing at the same time? Um, and that report came out pretty thunderous, but there was another interesting report he had covered. The Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative Program, set up by Penn State, which is an SSA taxing authority, has decided that they are a nonprofit organization. And because they're a nonprofit organization, they don't have to supply any records to the public on what they do or who they are. They are operating in secret. What we did find out, however, is the head of RGGI, uh, who must be making a hell of a salary, because he just went out and bought himself a new condo two blocks from their office in New York for two and a half million dollars, which you can see on this website. So there's a lot of money to be made in stopping global warming, I guess. But you know, you can be very effective, folks. And when I talk about grassroots activities and the things you can do, punching this message through the media has been rather challenging. It's hard to get through all the did about health care and the November election and just other things. So I want to give you a little example of one of our activists succeeded in doing just by being tenacious. Chris? Um, let's go to uh, Gina, Cherry Hills, New Jersey. What's up, Gina? How are you? Hi, Sean. Thanks for taking my call. Well, I actually had um, two questions to ask you. I um, voted for Chris Christie, and I was very happy to do so, and I think he's doing a lot of great things for New Jersey. But my two concerns about him were, and maybe you can clear this up for me, one, he, from what I've read about him, he's a supporter of cap and trade, and we have local, we have New Jersey cap and trade, and I haven't heard him talk about that at all, and like I said, I've only read that he's a supporter, which really bothers me coming from someone who's supposed to be a fiscal conservative. Yeah, uh, that, that's, I don't know about that specific example. Um, I was reading on Americans for, for Prosperity that in New Jersey that they were acting or ready to implement the government takeover of health care, and, and I know New Jersey has not signed on to any of these lawsuits uh, against so one activist gets on the phone and punches a message through. There's probably about five million people here in the course of an afternoon. So it works to get on talk radio. Um, so we're going to back up all of our effort right now with uh, this great TV spot that's already on the air. You may not have seen it yet in New York. You will. Shoot, Chris. The electric rates are skyrocketing all over New Jersey, and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative will drive them even higher by creating an artificial market in carbon permits. When fully implemented, rates can rise as much as 90% or more as speculators drive permit costs through the roof. And that bill goes not just to you, the energy consumer, but to your employer, the places you shop, and your local governments. The result? Higher taxes, lost jobs, and less freedom. It's got to stop. It's time to pull the plug on RGGI. That spot is easy, we just got to change one word to run that in New York. We, we want to start running that television where we have sponsors for appeal bill. Unfortunately, we can't find a single one uh, in New York. So there's a challenge ahead for you guys. Um, that's the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, folks. It's my goal in life to overturn this thing before it undermines the future of our prosperity and for my kids, because I like them to stay in this neck of the woods. But if the Northeast adopts and continues this program, we're going to further undermine our economic prosperity and the future of our state. And if we remember where the Tea Party came from, cap and trade was the initial spark that launched this movement. Um, and it should be an issue that we continue to work hard on, all of us, to see that it goes no further. So let's get to work, folks. That's my story, and I'd love to take questions.